Walt, I'm the director for the Idaho Department of Correction. Um, let me give a, a quick recount of events uh, from today, um, uh, starting with, with what I think most of you are most eager to hear about. Uh, earlier this morning, our medical team did a physical assessment of Mr. Creech. Uh, after that assessment, they had communicated uh, to me as well as Warden, uh, Warden Richardson that, that they believed and had confidence that they would be able to establish venous access on Mr. Creech. Uh, once Mr. Creech was escorted into the execution chamber uh, and was strapped down, the medical team entered and attempted to establish IV access. Uh, the team uh, attempted eight times uh, through multiple limbs and appendages uh, to establish IV access consistent with IDOC's policy. Uh, it's worth noting uh, in our conversations with the medical team afterwards that what they encountered in some instances was an access issue, uh, but in others where they could establish uh, access, they were unable, uh, it was a vein quality issue uh, that made them not confident in their ability to administer chemicals through the IV site once established. Uh, consistent with our training and with our protocols, uh, we uh, from the very beginning, try to be very candid and upfront that this isn't a do it at any cost process, that our first objective is to carry this out with dignity, professionalism, and respect. Uh, and part of that was training and practicing uh, for the chance that they were unable to establish IV access. Uh, once the medical team leader had determined that it would be unlikely uh, that they were going to be able to establish IV access, uh, that was when we halted the execution. Um, Mr. Creech, at this time, is back in his cell in F block. Uh, we are planning to allow the death warrant to expire because we don't anticipate a change in status or circumstance that would allow us to continue with the execution today. Uh, we don't have an idea of time frames or next steps at this point. Uh, those are things we will be discussing in the days ahead. Um, and once we have, once the state has determined the next course of action, we'll certainly uh, make those actions known in the appropriate venue. Uh, while I'm here, and, and I'll certainly defer to uh, the media witnesses to recount their experiences, uh, I do want to take a second to talk about uh, the confidence of our medical team and our confidence in them. Uh, as part of our training and rehearsals uh, for this, uh, every Every single member of our administrative team, including myself, uh, this is a team of competent medical professionals and we've allowed them to establish IV access on each of us individually. Uh, we train for a number of different scenarios and potential outcomes uh, and, and my confidence in this team just could not be higher. Uh, it's also worth noting that when you look at our SOP, the, the qualifications uh, that, that our medical team has, these are people uh, who in their day jobs, uh, people's lives depend on their ability to establish an IV. Uh, so our confidence in them remains high and, and, and while the execution was unsuccessful, I think their efforts were, uh, I think it would be wrong to call it a failure. They did their level best in a professional way uh, that was respectful of the process. And when it, when it appeared that those efforts were going to be unsuccessful, they did the right thing and opted to stop additional efforts uh, so that we could evaluate next steps. Um, with that, uh, I will uh, stop for a moment and allow the other witnesses to speak to their particular uh, experiences. And then I'm happy to answer any questions after that. Hello, I'm Rebecca Boone. I'm a correspondent with the Associated Press. I'll attempt to do sort of a minute-by-minute -minute recount of what we saw so that you can understand what happened. Um, let's see. So the media witnesses were brought into the witness room at 9.50 this morning. Um, we were in there with um, several other people, including Hayden Dodds uh, from the Board of Correction, Jared Larson from the Governor's Office, um, there was a correctional officer in there with us in Ada County Sheriff Clifford. Um, 
at 9.55, it sounded to me as if perhaps Mr. Creech's witnesses were being brought into the room, just so you understand that it is a separate witness room and we are not able to see them. They have their own window into the execution chamber. So what we can see when we sit in there is the execution chamber itself, which has a padded sort of medical style table with straps on it, a podium where the warden stands, um, two phones, one red, one black, and then in the walls there are some holes where the IV tubing goes into the medication room or the medical team room, which is actually behind the execution chamber and is not visible to us. The medical team um, apparently views Mr. Creech throughout the process, the ones that aren't in the execution room, via some um, closed circuit cameras, I think, and it, I saw two cameras or three cameras above the medical table itself. So that is where I presume they were viewing the events. Um, at 9.59, 9.59 this morning, I heard some faint pounding from outside our room. It's not clear what that pounding was. It sounded like somebody sort of rhythmically banging on metal. Um, I do not know what that sound was. It lasted for a few minutes and then stopped. At 10 a.m., um, the warden and the director and um, some correctional officers entered the execution room, followed um, almost immediately by uh, the escort team, which was six people um, escorting Mr. Creech in. He was already on a gurney. Um, they brought him in. They moved him via a backboard to the execution table and then began strapping him down, um, first his right arm, then his left. Uh, he seemed fairly, he was not moving much during this process. He wasn't fidgeting. Um, the escort team was standing at attention when they weren't actively strapping him down. And that placement of him on the table was complete by 10.03. Um, once he was on the table, he was looking at people in his witness area, which was adjacent to ours, um, and appeared to be talking or mouthing some things. Um, at 10.04, about the medical team began assessing um, his veins and, uh, and applying an EKG to his, test, to his chest to monitor his heart rate. Um, and they took several steps to uh, sort of prepare his arm, his right arm for access to the IV. Um, they used devices including like a, like a laser device or an infrared device, a vein finder tool. They used a hot compress. Um, they attached a blood pressure cuff that they inflated to try to get the veins to distend. Um, so by about 10.11, they began trying to establish the first IV. And within two minutes, at 10.13, they decided the first IV attempt was unsuccessful. They again tried a new site. They, each, each IV step took several steps, right? So they would clean the skin. They would um, up, inject a numbing agent. They would re-clean the skin. Um, and then they would attempt to insert the IV itself. IVs continued to be attempted in each arm first, so they tried the right arm first, they tried the hand, they tried the left arm, both sides, and then they decided that they needed to move to his legs. Um, and at that point, they removed the sheet that was covering his legs, took off his orange, uh, like slide on style shoes, um, pulled up the his green scrub style pants, and then worked around the um, hook and loop style straps that were restraining both of his ankles. At that point, they moved the medical cart that they were using to hold their supplies to near Mr. Creech's feet, so it would be next to where they were working. This obscured our view partially, and we were unable to see exactly how many attempts directly that they were trying. However, based on the number of times they inflated the cuff and used numbing agents, our count was also eight attempts. Oh, let's see. So by 10.43, they were still, oh sorry, at 10.41, they were still attempting to find IV sites. At that point, one of the medical team members opened a drawer in the cart, appeared to see that they were running low on supplies. That person left the room, came back with the pocket of his um, sort of scrub style navy blue jacket filled with supplies. When he left, 
Director T. Walt followed him briefly out of the room and also came back quickly. Um, and that medical team member made an additional trip out to get, I think, one more thing. Um, the supplies were then restocked. They were still attempting um, repeatedly uh, throughout the next several minutes. At 10.54, Mr. Creech lifted his head, looked at the, um, uh, the, the medical team and said, my legs hurt a bit. At that point, they appeared to try to like lift or move his legs to apparently relieve some of that discomfort. Um, throughout this process, Mr. Creech was looking at the people in his um, witness room. He was sometimes, his arms were strapped, but he was sometimes waving like this or waggling, you know, like wagging his fingers at them. He was sometimes mouthing things to them, um, but he wasn't saying anything loud enough that we could hear it. Um, at 1057, uh, Warden Richardson and Director T. Walt spoke to each other quietly, nodded, and then um, the warden went and spoke to the uh, medical team. Also at that time, the medical team began removing the EKG. Um, they, um, they left by 1058, and um, that's when Warden Richardson announced that the execution would be halted because of the inability to find a successful IV site. We were taken out of the room a short time later. Before we left, I saw Director Richardson walk over to Mr. Creech. At one point, he placed his, arm, his hand on his arm. He whispered to him quietly. Then he moved around to the other side of Mr. Creech, where he was on the table so that his back was to the windows and appeared to be talking with him as Creech nodded back. Um, when the warden announced that the execution would be halted, Mr. Creech looked at the people in, his, um, in the separate room um, his witnesses and um, waved at them again and then um, sort of closed his eyes and shook his head. Hi, I'm uh, Brenda with KTVB. Um, Rebecca did a great job explaining uh, minute by minute, but I'm going to start with uh, when he was brought in, to, uh, in that gurney. It started on time. It started at 10 o'clock. Uh, he was brought in in that gurney. He was still strapped in that gurney, um, and then he was lifted and uh, put on the uh, table, and they covered him with a white blanket. At 10.03, uh, that's when he made eye contact with his family. He waved or to... Uh, his witnesses on that uh, room there. Uh, he waved, and again, like Rebecca mentioned, you, you could just see his, his fingers move there. Um, but he was locked in with his family at 10.03, 10 that is. At 10.04, he actually made contact with us uh, to see who the other witnesses were. He didn't really do, he didn't say anything, he didn't mumble. Um, he just looked at us and, and then just laid back down. That's when the team, the medical team, started the process. They took some uh, breathing assessment. Um, they also put five what they were calling stickers um, on his chest and then two on his abdomen. I did catch at 10.06, he, uh, throughout this whole entire process, he would mumble words, but I was able to catch what he said at 10.06, looking at his family. Um, it appeared that he said, I'm sorry, um, looking at his family again. At 10.10, that's when the first IV was administered, and like Rebecca mentioned, it started at the right arm, went over to the left one, and then they had to go uh, take off his shoes and, and proceed with, with his legs. Um, this happened eight times. Um, through each time, though, I did notice that uh, Creech, every time the IV was administered, he would make this uh, snoring no noise. Um, he would also twitch, what he would appear, it appeared that he would go in and out of his sleep. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned, he, he would twitch and then, and, and snore. Um, there was another point at 10.32 where I was able to make out uh, what he was saying um, to his, his uh, witness room there. It appears that he said, I love you. This was after a couple of attempts at uh, the administering the IV. Um, after that, he went to that, uh, again, to the, the noises, the snoring noises, 
and um, the, the twitching that he would do. Um, I will also mention, kind of backtracking here, in the room, um, the medical staff, they were covered in white cloth. Uh, they also had goggles. Um, and there was uh, about three of them administering this uh, uh, IV. Um, there was a point, the seventh time, uh, where, when the IV was administered at 10.54, like Rebecca mentioned, he did say, my legs hurt a bit. Um, that's when the medical staff helped him lift his legs up. Um, I will also note that from what I could see, from my point of view, um, he didn't seem like he was in pain. The only time that he, he really said he was was at 1054 when he said, again, quote, my legs hurt a bit. Um, then after that moment, he shook his head. He would shake his head sometimes. I'm just looking at his family. At 10.58, that's when uh, the execution was halted. That's when it was announced. Um, they couldn't find, um, they weren't able to have any successful attempts. Uh, so that's when it was halted. Uh, we were actually told to leave the room. Creech was still laying there on the, the table. Um, and when that announcement was made, from my point of view, he was looking up and mumbling a couple of words. I didn't make that out, but uh, he would just look up to, to the roof and, and just mumble a couple words there. Um, after that, we were escorted, but uh, he was uh, told a couple of words that we also weren't able to hear, but then we left the room. I'm Scott McIntosh from the Idaho Statesman. I don't have much to add. I will um, corroborate um, what Rebecca Boone said and what Brenda Rodriguez said. Um, I also, when um, Mr. Creech came into the room, um, he looked back at his witness room and his eyes started to fill with tears and I heard him sniffling and he seemed to be um, puffing a little bit, and um, I will also uh, say that I could not hear what Mr. Creech said, but based on his lips moving, it looked like he said, I'm sorry. Um, so I will confirm that. Um, the only other thing I'll add is uh, that the medical staff, there were three of them, there was one head person and two assistants. Um, they were dressed in blue scrubs, head to toe, and their faces were covered completely um, except for their eyes with white cloth, um, and then their eyes were covered with um, safety goggles, safety glasses. Um, there was one moment when they were trying to put an IV in his right hand that it seemed like his hand was twitching and hurting. Um, other than that, I will also um, uh, confirm that uh, it did not seem that he was in discomfort or pain um, during that, that hour-long process. Um, other than that, I'll, uh, I'll stand for questions. I'm Roland Barris from Idaho News 6, KIVI-TV, ABC. Um, the other witnesses have given a really good um, rundown of everything that pretty much happened. I, I guess I want to just add a little bit of perspective from what a, a bizarre circumstance this is for anyone to go witness. Uh, I think going into the room, um, seeing someone lifted off of a gurney onto an execution table is just surreal. Um, and then to see the operators in, in the room, who, in my opinion, were very professional. Um, again, Creech, to me, did not look like he was in pain at any time, uh, any severe pain. M mild discomfort, I might say, from time to time. Uh, but it is bizarre also to see, as you described, you know, the medical techs with a uh, cap on, goggles, face mask, pretty much covered almost head to toe. It's a strange sort of thing to see. At one point, they covered him with a uh, white sheet, and it was kind of bizarre to see how they, it was almost like when you unfurl a flag of some sort, and they did it with a flourish almost. Um, and then he was covered with a white, uh, 
cheat. And I guess I would say just lastly, you know, as, as time went by and, and the, the attempts continued to fail, um, at first there was very clear communication from the techs, you know, Mr. Creech, another, you know, this IV attempt has failed. Um, it, you could sense the frustration in the room um, as time went along. And I think I timed it, I don't know about you guys, maybe somewhere around 46, 47 minutes total from the time of the first one, IV. Somewhere around there, uh, 45 to 47 minutes. Uh, it's a long time. Um, about 57 you have? Sure. Um, so, understandably, I think you could uh, see there was some frustration in the room a little bit um, as they tried to get more equipment in and try and try again. Um, and I, I guess I would leave it open to question now, since there's probably going to be some other questions, whether or not there is a certain number that you decide to call it at, or is it just left up to the media, or to the, uh, not to the media, of course, but to the, the medical folks to handle that? Yeah, real quick, just a couple, uh, <clears throat> couple things to add context. Um, the, the, when Mr. Creech noted discomfort uh, with his leg, uh, he was experiencing a cramp, uh, and, and the medical team uh, worked to try to assuage that. Um, uh, I wasn't sure how briefed everybody was on the timeline, but um, uh, Mr. Creech spent the entirety of the, the, entirety of the evening uh, up until about a quarter till five this morning uh, with his attorneys as well as his wife, Leanne. Um, uh, he uh, took a mild sedative as he's afforded to do per policy um, and, and actually uh, was able to sleep for at least a little bit um, prior to uh, this morning's event. So uh, I think there was, uh, as noted, um, you know, he, he was uh, very tired um, when, when he was brought into the execution chamber. Uh, in terms of uh, a set number of attempts, uh, we rely on, on the direction of our medical team. Uh, we, ap I met with them after uh, Mr. Creech had, had a physical examination this morning. Um, they, we had established that we, that we thought there were potentially eight access points. Uh, those are the points they attempted to access, uh, and when it became clear that that wasn't going to be uh, wasn't going to be successful, uh, that's when the execution was halted. Um, one other thing to note: um, the medical team leader did uh, leave the room um, uh, to gather additional supplies um, after the assessment this morning. Uh, they had opted to look at smaller gauge catheters to try to establish IV access. Uh, and so it was to it was to get additional um, smaller gauge catheters uh, for their continued attempts. So, with that, any additional questions? I, I wanted to clarify that uh, the state isn't sure what the next steps kind of look like moving forward. Clarify that a little bit. Yeah, uh, I I think what we've what we've established right now is that we have a death warrant that expires today. Uh, uh, I, I know, and I apologize. I've been debriefing and some other things, so I'm not as up to speed on the legal maneuvering that's taken place, but I, I believe we have stipulated that we will not make further attempts on this death warrant to try to carry it out. Um, but in terms of in terms of, of establishing when to seek another death warrant or if to seek another death warrant, I think those are discussions that have to happen in the days ahead to, number one, determine whether or not circumstances will be different. Um, or, so those are the kind of things, those are the kind of discussions that, that it would be premature to say this is going to happen next until we have the benefit of having those discussions. In terms of the state protocols, uh, does anything plan for this sort of thing? No, I, from a, a protocol standpoint, we have the, the preferred method is to establish a peripheral line. And that's what they attempted to do and, and finding those access sites. Uh, we have we have concerns about secondary methods that you know this isn't I, I think it's worth noting that this isn't emergency medicine this is a heavily regulated process um, that that requires it be treated with uh, 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 with a, a deference to being mindful of 
of not violating the Eighth Amendment or creating any cruel and unusual punishment type claims. So uh, where there are other medical procedures that would require surgical intervention or, or something of that nature, um, you know, there are some policies that in other states that allow for that. Um, we're not comfortable with that at this point. Uh, so, but those are the types of things that we're going to be evaluating in the days ahead to try to determine uh, the path forward. Uh, as a follow-up on that question, Mr. Chair, um, another state, Alabama, had used nitrogen gas when the same thing did. Or is that an option for Idaho? Uh, at this point, Idaho law provides for uh, uh, execution by lethal injection or firing squad now. Uh, we do not have uh, the facilities or physical capabilities of carrying out firing squad. Um, and, and we'll continue to work on, on those efforts. But uh, state law doesn't allow for nitrogen hypoxia, so uh, it would take a change in statute for that to be an option. Uh, but again, uh, our efforts have been focused on carrying out the death penalty under the methods that are prescribed under state law today. Director, is there, is there a time factor with the medication that is involved in this? As you seek a new death uh, warrant, um, is there any concern that it expires or that there's a problem with the, the medication holding up until another attempt? No, no, no concerns. I, I mean, our, our policies are, are pretty strict in, in that, you know, we have uh, certain standards in place uh, to ensure that the, the chemicals that we use are, in fact, the chemicals we're supposed to use, that, that they're not, uh, that we're not using anything with a beyond use date. Uh, uh, and that we have testing uh, to verify the, the, the authenticity of those chemicals. And so that it, it, is, it is the same consideration for uh, any execution we undertake. So today's events uh, won't, won't change the calculus on that. There is a timeline, though, where it can, it does go bad. It does have a, an explanation. Yeah, at at day, some point, yeah, anything. absolutely. Right. Absolutely. But, but again, uh, you know, our, our decision making is based on our ability to carry out an execution with dignity, professionalism, and respect, not dates on chemicals. That's a, that's a secondary issue. Can you walk us through whether or not the drugs were actually loaded into syringes and whether or not they have now been, you know, quote, unquote, used in, in the longer future the potential execution? Yeah, uh, in accordance with our policy, uh, prior to, uh, uh, prior to, uh, just prior to Mr. Preach entering the chamber, our policy prescribes that those that we have trays that are prepared. So the chemicals that we had uh, for today's execution uh, are mostly, they're unusable in future executions. Now we can do all three doses because you have a backup and a backup to the backup. Two of the three. Two of the three. Yeah. So yep. there is still one dose that is available? But potentially, yeah. Was there, there was one in the back. I, that was my question. Oh, I, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, Preach was not offered a chance to say final words because the ID was never uh, established. Is that correct? Correct. We we did not get to a, a place in the process where he was afforded that opportunity. Uh, when you say he had physical examination this morning, does that have to do with assessing his veins? Correct. Uh, yeah, the, the purpose of that examination uh, was for our medical team to assess their uh, their likelihood of being able to establish IV access. And as, as, go, ahead. go ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, and as I noted before, it, it wasn't a simple access issue. It was also a quality issue. Uh, and, and in their professional judgment, and, and I wholeheartedly agree with it, 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 uh, it would not have been appropriate to try to move forward with a potential uh, with an IV site that is collapsed or, or with infiltration. So, so following up on uh, the backup and so forth, uh, in order to carry out an execution, you would need a backup dose in a future potential execution, correct? Correct. Okay, so two have been used, and my doctor then have one in its possession currently. Uh, correct, but but again, I, I'm not going to speculate on chemicals for future executions. I think we have a, a high level of confidence that we'll be able to secure the chemicals necessary to carry out an execution by lethal injection. Um, uh, but we'll we'll cross that bridge when it's in front of us. But you're talking about an acquisition of additional chemicals. Is that from the same supplier where these ones came from? 
I will speak about our supplier as often as I always speak about our supplier, and that's to say that I won't speak about our supplier. Fair enough, but it, it, is our understanding correct that you do expect that you'll have to seek out new chemicals um, for another uh, execution attempt? Correct. Okay. You said that there were eight, so solidified eight attempts, and I believe um, maybe it was Rebecca. Somebody else asked a, a question, um, and that was because there were eight established possible injection sites. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, is Mr. Creech's wife and is his family still there? I know he's back in his cell. Were they able to have time together afterwards? Yeah, we, uh, uh, as I was leaving IMSI, we were in the process of, of moving Mr. Creech from F block to medical so that his wife could, could uh, go back and visit him again. And then uh, the, the facility's making preparations right now on, on his longer term placement. What, what saving after the conversation after the uh, I have not had the conversation with him after it failed. Uh, Warden Richardson uh, uh, has a, um, a good rapport with Mr. Creech, and, and he and the warden had a conversation. I'm not aware of the contents of that conversation. Uh, you acknowledged that this execution was unsuccessful. Uh, you said it was wrong to call it a failure. Um, Mr. Creech's attorneys have referred to this as a botched execution. How do you respond? Well, I'll respond to Mr. Creech's attorneys in court, but I, I think from a broader context, you know, what's clear to us and, and what, we, what we rehearse and practice and train uh, is that Everything we do is with the goal in mind of ensuring that this process is carried out with dignity, professionalism, and respect. And when it reaches a point in that process at any step where it looks like we're going to be unable to do that, that's when we call it off. And so I, I think uh, for us, it, it wasn't a difficult decision. It was the right decision uh, to halt any future attempts at trying to establish IV access, let's call it. And, and we'll discuss next steps after that. So I, I think, you know, what what is, um, you know, that that's, again, our goal is to do this in a in a manner befitting the gravity of such an occasion, uh, such an occasion, and attempting to try to move forward with an execution uh, when you don't have the confidence it can be carried out in that respect. I think that would be the definition of a botched execution. Um, could you walk us through the level of medical training held by members on the medical team? Are they phlebotomists? Are they EMTs? Are they yeah, I, I won't get into the specific uh, medical qualifications except to say that the requirements to be a member of our medical team are clearly spelled out in our SOP, um, which is publicly available. Uh, and, and there are regular checks to ensure that they maintain their certifications. I'll go above and beyond that, as I noted before, uh, as a demonstration of our confidence in their competence in what they do. Uh, every single person who's involved in this execution planning process um, has volunteered to have IVs established by this medical team. So while they were unable to establish a suitable uh, IV access point today, uh, our confidence in them is unwavering. Two more questions. Okay, mine's kind of a double header. So, has, as far as you know, this has never happened in the state of Idaho before? Correct. Okay, and has anybody on the medical team ever performed an execution before? Yes. They have in Idaho? Correct. Okay, so they have a history of doing so. Yeah. Okay. One last question then. Um, I've always heard that when you're under an attack, if you will, your veins shut down because the external veins will sort of collapse in order to protect you from attack. It's a natural thing that occurs. Um, it, doesn't it make it problematic when you're fearful for your life that you're about to die, that the veins will be difficult to find? You are asking me to weigh into an area where I have zero expertise. So, I, I mean, I, 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 I can't. I can't necessarily comment on, on that uh, respect, um, except to, to note, you know, the qualifications that are in our SOP. Um, you know, these medical team members are, as a routine course of their work, 
uh, are, are used to dealing in high stress, high pressure, high stakes situations. Um, and, and, you know, again, we're confident in their abilities, but I can't speak to uh, how the circumstances may have affected Mr. Creech or the quality of his veins today.